How many love Time Change Sunday? Yeah, that's right. Nobody. I know this might be the last one. How many of you have made peace with coffee and caffeine this morning? Anybody? Yeah, extra dose. Man, I am so jacked up. I got halfway to church this morning and realized I forgot my car. That's how jacked up on caffeine I am. Last week, I had a chance to join a handful of pastors from around the nation. They flew in for a lead pastor's getaway. It's something that uh, I, I get invited to a lot, but I never go. I always say no. I always come up with a reason. There's always some tragedy or some excuse or some family emergency or something that's always going on that seems to take precedent over getting away and allowing other pastors to pour into other pastors. But this time, my wife and several of you encouraged me, go, go, you need it, right? Go. So we landed in this little place called Nebo, North Carolina. Has anybody heard of Nebo? Yeah, all right. That's two people. That's pretty much it. And it's in the middle of nowhere. There's like no cell phone connection. But it was such an incredible retreat. When I pulled up, I knew it was going to be something special. This was the view out back behind our cabin. Man, a lake, it had a dock, a double-decker dock. I'd never seen one of those. It had kayaks you could take out. And when we pulled up, we opened the doors, and these three or four men started running down these stairs saying, don't move, don't move. I'm like, uh-oh, <laughs> there's snakes, right? And they came, and they said, we want to get your luggage. I'm like, oh. I went to grab it. and said, no, you don't lift a finger. We are here to love you, to serve you. I'm like, wow, these guys are hardcore, all right. So they grabbed us stuff, and I brought my diet sun drop and everything, just in case they didn't have anything that I could drink. And they whisk it upstairs, and they go in, and they sit us down around this huge farm table, and then they serve us course after course of food, homemade, prepared by them. These are other pastors who have taken a week off to come love on other pastors, to pour into those who pour into others. See what I'm saying? So it's this beautiful time of service. And they like, I went to get up to go get another refill. And they said, what are you doing? Sit down. Sit down. What do you need? I said, I was going to get another drink. They said, no, let us serve you. This is, they were so passionate about it. It was so incredible. They would fix breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, homemade cakes. All, I gained eight more pounds. It was awesome. And I, I've repented of it, but it is so good. They would wake us up, lead us in these devotionals, these incredible Bible studies, just glorious stuff that just, just pouring into us. It was so powerful, so refreshing to see people do this out of the goodness of their heart. And they paid for everything. Like, I have got two weeks of conference and revivals that the church covers every I didn't even use it. I never use it. it. Not only did they not let me pay for it, they wouldn't let the potter's hand pay for this. Uh, uh, an anonymous benefactor for, called, uh, I think, Church Boom with that organization came and said, we're paying for all these pastors. It was thousands of dollars. They said, leave your wallet, which is good. I lost my wallet. I lost it for three days before I even knew it. That tells you how incredible this was. And so on the end of the last day, one of the last sessions, they said, you have to get out of your comfort zone and do something you don't normally do. And for me, it was fly fishing. Uh, yeah, yo, you could laugh. It's okay. It was, it was every bit exactly what I expected it to be. And it was 40 degrees. It was uh, down in this, this, this gully. And it was gorgeous. We had a bald eagle fly overhead. It was just, it was incredible. And we were there standing in the 40 degree water for five hours, nonstop without a bathroom, without a bottle of water, without nothing. You know, had they told me that, I would have been even less excited to go. So we're sitting there fishing, and people are starting to catch these fish, and I'm looking around, and I'm the only one not catching them. And then by the end of the five hours, our time on the river was, was ending. The, the guides, I guess, felt sorry for us. Mitchell hadn't caught one yet. Bring him down to the honey hole. So they moved me down. It's like the walk of shame. I'm like, here we go. I got my pole. And I go, and there's this, instead of being six inches deep because it hadn't rained, there was no snow melt off, so there's just, the fish could see you, and they were spooked, and, you know, it was, it was miserable. And so they bring me down the thing where this waterfall goes into a 10-foot deep, and there's like 50 fish staring at me. And I'm like, really? The last five minutes of this trip, you're going to bring me to this, like now. And like, just drop your line in. So I drop my line in, and, I'm, and they put a new lure on that hangs about three feet into the water. It's this little furry thing. And all the fish go toward it. And I'm tugging on and they're about to bite. And I can feel them nibbling for the first time in five hours, y'all. This is like, I needed this. And the guide, true story, comes up behind me, puts his arms around me. He says, let me show you. Let me show you a trick. Puts his hand on my pole, and he starts to tug just a little bit like this. And a fish bites on it. And he goes, he yanks, he yanks it up, and the fish is hanging right there. And I said, that, that doesn't count. 
you caught that fish. You caught that. Why, why would you come up? I had this. He's like, no, no, it's all yours. It's your. I'm like, it is not my, that is, that doesn't count. And he said, no, everyone has to get a picture. So I said, I refuse to count this. I will be the net guy. So this is me with the net over here. I'm the, I got the little net, my little trout. No one could keep them. They were too small, but we caught some trout. So over here on the right, this is us after five hours, and all we had to eat was a box of Doritos on the ground. It was pitiful. I took one video, and I said, baby, should I show the church this? Is this, is this like, this is really embarrassing. She's like, you absolutely must show this video. It's 55 seconds. It's not long. I want you to take a peek. All this is right, just a little bit of how it went. Fishing. Getting ready to cast. And wee! All right, you're looking for a yellow thing here. Let me see if I can zoom. Hankins and Nick Newman, Josh down there, and Asani, Pastor Tim, and I am the first one on the river, all the way up here, got it all to myself. All right, watch this cast. I'm doing a left-handed even. Whee! Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> I caught a tree. That's all. Okay, let's try something. Yeah, I caught a tree. I caught a tree. Left it. Yes, you can applaud. That was fantastic. <laughs> applaud my pain. It's beautiful. I mean, left hand. I was having a video with the right hand. So I'm like, check this. Out. Wee! I'm like, are you serious? I caught a tree. The one, and they had to come rescue it. It was so embarrassing. It was. Other than that, it was fantastic. One of the things that we learned in a breakout session was how the church, in these days that are going darker, the church cannot be divided. We have got to be one. And in Galatians three, which is what we're going to be in today. We see Paul talking about this oneness of Christ, and it is this incredible theme that you see all throughout the the, the book. But in chapter 3, there's just something amazing that happens where it it dovetails perfectly with with the session. We are sons and daughters of the high king, not because of what we've done, but because of his grace. We can't earn it. We can't be good enough for it. And that should free us. It's only because of what God did and his grace. And I, I read about this meeting uh, at a place called Cane Ridge Meeting House. It's this little cabin out in the middle of Bourbon County, Kentucky. And something incredible happened here in 1801. 10,000 people from all over the, the area came from different denominational backgrounds, different, different creeds, and, and where they would never agree, but they came to meet together to worship the Lord and leave behind all their divisive denominational issues, all their creeds, all their things. They would, and they just wanted to be unified under the banner of Jesus. And over 40 different pastors took turns sharing and preaching. Pastors from Baptist, and Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutheran, all of them. Pulpits were set up all over the yard with different people gathered around. Over 10,000 people came, and they all preached one message, the glory of Christ, the unity that is found, the gospel, the message that unites. And something supernatural happened, and The spirit moved and poured out on their hearts. And out of that revival meeting was born one of the great awakenings of all time. In fact, it actually has a name. It's the Restoration Movement, a movement to restore New Testament Christianity to churchianity, to do away with the fluff, all the man-made traditions and stuff that we tack on and get back to the basics, get back to what it is that unites us under the lordship of Jesus. And one of the leaders of that movement stated the purpose like this. He said this, our purpose is to destroy sectarianism or sectarian props and creeds and divisive labels to promote love, peace, and unity among Christians to free the Bible from the rubbish of human tradition and to restore to the world the unadulterated gospel of the kingdom. These goals shall be the North Star to which our attention and exertion shall be chiefly directed. Isn't that awesome? Can you hear it? It's 200 years old. Can you hear the, the, almost like the, the British voice in that? Their goal and our goal is to unite it under the lordship of Jesus. I don't care if you come from a Methodist background like I used to years ago before I became a Baptist, before I became a Christian. I don't care if you're from a Lutheran background or a Pentecostal holiness, church, God, Nazarene, evangelical. It doesn't matter what denominational. If you have surrendered to the lordship of Jesus Christ, then you are my brother or my sister in him. 
There is no distinction, and Paul is talking about this. It doesn't matter if you are white, black, Asian, Hispanic, male, female, rich, poor, smart, ignorant, skinny, chubby. It doesn't matter. If you have God as your father, then I am your brother. And Paul is setting this up in Galatians 3. It's a theme that's called the oneness of grace. That's all of us from different backgrounds, different cultures, different geographical settings, setting aside our differences, all these man-made traditions, and live out our commitment to Jesus and to one another. Okay, it's that love God, love people. And y'all, this is so countercultural to today. I'm not talking about easy believism. I'm not talking about group hug. We are the world. I'm not talking about ecumenical. We all come together. It doesn't matter what you believe. I'm talking it matters that Jesus is central. And this is not what the world wants. The world does not want to see us united. The world wants to divide us. The enemy wants to divide. The news wants us to be divided, to come at each other and to be separate and not show this incredible love that only Jesus can bring. But I think there is something amazing on the precipice of happening in churches today. Some of you sense it. It's not just limited to the Cain house awakening from the 1801s. It's not just limited to the day of Pentecost. It can happen again. And we see God is stirring something up that is absolutely incredible. Look at verse 26 of Galatians 3. See if you can sense something here. For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on the character of Christ, like putting on new clothes. I love how that's worded there. There is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham belongs to you. Wow. What is that about, right? What, what, what is going on here? Right here, we see two very specific things that we are united. The first one is we are united to Christ. This is where it all starts. Don't get lost in this. This is Christianity Doctrine 101. You need to know this. We are united first to Christ. Jesus never came and commanded us to be united to a particular theological movement, a particular denomination. He said we are to be committed and united to him. And he, you know, it reminds me of these, these great stories where this one speaker showed up at a Baptist meeting, and he was speaking to all these other pastors, and he says, you, you Baptist Christians do things differently. You, you do this. You know, and, and you, you, you do this over here, but I don't understand about you in the middle, you Christian Christians. Like what? It was like he was struggling to put it in words because he didn't have a label, right? He didn't understand. Uh, my very first pastor, when I was 19 years old, took me under his wing and he said, true story, a lady came up and said, I don't like you Baptist people because you're so narrow-minded. You preach Jesus the only way. It's almost like you think you're the only ones that are going to make it to heaven. And he said... Lady, I hate to tell you, we're more narrow-minded than that. I don't even think all Baptists are going to make it to heaven. <laughs> you know, this, is, this, is the, this is what the world sees. They see these fragments. I had a lost person literally tell me years ago, I'm so confused by your churches because I drive up down the road and every single one has a different name. And it's like you believe different things, yet you all claim to worship the one true God. Can you explain that? <sighs> Ooh, that's pretty hard. That's pretty hard when we have all these little offshoots that we've, we've messed up the gospel, made it something so complicated, so much convoluted with, with man's ideas. Right here in verse 36, Paul explains how the church can be united to Christ. He says this, he says, for you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus. There it is, right there. The answer to how we are united with Christ is this, we are united through faith. Don't miss that. We are united through faith. That is not something we've earned. That's not something we do. That's not a work we do. I'm not a child of God because I walked down an aisle when I was 19 and shook a pastor's hand. It's not because I've memorized the Apostles' Creed or the, the Catechism of Westminster. It's not because I take the Lord's Supper on a regular basis. I'm a child of God because I have placed my faith and trust in Jesus and what he has done in the finished work of the cross, the resurrection, period, full stop. I didn't earn it. I can't be good enough. And the same goes for you. If you have placed your faith in Jesus, then we are united. My question is, does the world buy that? Does the world see us united? Online, do they see us united? With words overflowing of grace and love? Or do we contribute to the division? 
Do they sense what Paul is talking about here, this oneness in Christ? The issue is not what denomination you belong to. The issue is who is it that you believe in? Paul goes on to say this in verse 26. He says, For you are all children of God through faith in Christ Jesus, and all who have been united with Christ in baptism have put on the character of Christ, like putting on new clothes. It's such a great, great visual image. So we see very clearly the next way we are united to Christ is through baptism. We are united in baptism. Now listen, you need to know the historical context of what's happening here. Paul is writing to people who... When they came to faith in Christ, they were immediately baptized. There was no putting it off. It would be foreign for New Testament writers to think, hey, you made your profession in faith in Christ. That's awesome. Don't tell anybody. <laughs> Keep it down low. Well, maybe in a few months we'll get together and we'll, we'll baptize you. We'll, we'll see if maybe you can make your faith. No. It was baptized immediately, if not soon thereafter. This was something that they would think what we do today is so strange. In the New Testament times, if you had a profession of faith in Christ, you made that public sign of that covenant. It's a covenant of what God has done. You demonstrate that, that we're all in, and you're announcing that, this public change of what has happened privately within. All right, think of it like this. When you get married, you say your vows, right? You come, you say your vows, and then you each exchange what? A ring. It's this great time, full of stress, and usually the ring bearer drops it, or like our wedding, they pass out right at that moment. And we have the video for it. It's awesome. And imagine if the pastor comes and we're married. I'm standing next to Amy. And we take these vows forever. I will love you and cherish you. Till that. And then it comes to the part now where you exchange rings to publicly seal this and commit. Imagine if I said, oh, yeah, about that. I don't think we need to do that. Wait, what? Yeah, no, no, no. I'm yours, baby. Everybody should know. It's all good. You know, but if I go to the club or the restaurant tonight and stuff and... It, there's no sign that you are publicly off the market, and it's just a sign of your love. You know, can you imagine what she would say? She'd say, what, what's that? Are you ashamed of me? Are you? Why would you not take that next step and show the public reality of what I just confessed to her? You see what I'm saying? God instructs us not only to confess our faith in him, but to publicly demonstrate our commitment to him in baptism. This is where grace is confirmed and recognized in this act. Remember the historical context, what Paul's dealing with. Paul is dealing with legalists left and right. And he's got these people coming up in the Galatian churches. Don't forget, they come up and they say, you must receive the circumcision of Moses to be right with God. There's just one problem with that. Who can be circumcised? Only males, right? Think, think about this. This was, a, this was a, a, performed as a sign of the old covenant. It was a basis of division between genders, sometimes even other races, but it was decided for them. Maybe you had a decision like that. Maybe you were decided, maybe your parents had you, like I was, baptized as an infant or sprinkled, but I didn't make that call. See, circumcision, the child being circumcised had no choice in the matter. It was something that was decided for him, right? I mean, no baby boy has ever been born and said, Hey, I got an idea, <laughs> right? Before you all take me home, wrap me up like a little burrito, I have another surgical procedure in mind, right? Never has a baby boy been born and said that. It was decided for them. And in the same route, we look at this, baptism is a sign of the new covenant, a decision that you make because Jesus himself was baptized. We follow in that, and now it's for both male, female, all races, every socioeconomic. It is a demonstration of the change within that we are now making public. The NSB gives a great literal translation of this verse. It says this, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. See, in baptism, we all put on the same clothes. We all put on Christ, and we stand united. This is our very first act of obedience. When we're lowered into those baptism waters, you even hear me say, buried in the likeness of Christ, raised to walk in the newness of life. All those divisions are left, all that sin, all that garbage, everything that separates us from being unified comes and stays under the water. And now we come up, we rise up as one body in Christ. So let me ask, if you're a believer, if you've been a Christ follower for years and you have never followed through with believer's baptism, I have great news. We are baptizing again on December 4th. And we're going to be baptizing several people that have come forward, made a profession of faith, and we are going to do our best to line this up 
if this is you and you would like to be considered for baptism, will you come up to me immediately following church and just tell me? We'll walk you through the steps. We're going to be baptizing a lot of people, so the water will be fine. It'll be 101 degrees. It'll be awesome. And we will all make a public confession of faith. The next way we are united to each other is very clear. It says we are united to each other. So the fact that we're united to Christ, most people get that. We understand that. But the second part's a little more difficult. You know why? Because we got 2,000 years of church splits and divisions and schisms in the lost world looking at us going, you all aren't united. We're supposed to know we're Christians by our love. But you all look like you're just like us. And we act and behave in, in ways that we take these disagreements and the world is so used to seeing a divided church. They have never known a time when there haven't been numerous denominations, numerous sects and sectarian divisions and splits. But that's not how it was meant to be. Jesus is the Lord of the church, one head of the church, and we operate under his authority. If you are united to Christ, then you are united with all the others who are united to Christ, regardless of the denomination, regardless of their skin color, regardless of their gender. I will never forget, 30 years ago, I heard this man preach. If you don't recognize him, his name's Wellington Boone. This guy is phenomenal. The right corner up of his pocket there, there's a little logo. Can anybody read it? Promise Keepers. I was here <clears throat> 30 years ago. I was 19 year old, brand new ministerial student, Georgia Dome. And Wellington Boone came out. And I remember to this day, he said, If God is your father, then I am your brother. You must accept me as I accept you. We are family. I'm so thankful I heard it at that age. If God is your father, then you are my brother. Paul's referring to these important truths. They must be accepted if we want to experience the oneness of grace. The first one he lists in verse 28, look what he says. He says, there is no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. So you see what Paul's saying? He's saying right now, all the divisions have been removed. All the distinctions have been taken away because of Jesus. He has bought us back by his shed blood. I think we think division and prejudice is something new, like it's only gotten worse. Paul dealt with this. It was awful. Even back then in Paul's day, it was not uncommon for male Jews to wake up in the morning and declare, God, I thank you that I am not a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. That is a legitimate prayer that they prayed. Think about that. So knowing that, what about Paul? No wonder he's saying, guys, there's no longer Jew or Gentile. There's no longer slave or free. There's no longer male or free. He is dropping a truth grenade right in the middle of human tradition. And he is blowing people's minds. God would have none of that. Jesus says there is no room for discrimination or racism or gender problems or favoritism based on somebody having more money or you coming from the right side of the tracks. I think people are going to be so shocked in heaven by who's there and who's not. It's almost like we operate like we're going to come in one day and be like, oh, where's the rich heaven? I want to go into that. Where's the white category? There's not going to be an Asian group or a black group. There's not going to be a female corner or a male corner. There's not going to be any hyphenated Christians. It's just going to be Christians. It's going to be people paid for by the blood of the lamb. We're going to be adopted into one family. That's what's so awesome about those groups like, like Promise Keepers and, and Passion and Acquire the Fire and all of these Heart of the City and even Winter Jam Worship where we come together under the banner of Jesus. And we are saved, delivered, and healed by the Savior himself, and we worship. Look how Paul says this in verse 29. He says, now that you belong to Christ, you are the true children of Abraham. You are his heirs, and God's promise to Abraham is now yours. It belongs to you. Did you catch the distinction there? It's not for everybody. Did you catch who will be the heirs? Who shares in the promise of eternal life? A lot of people miss this. Okay, I'm just going to wade out here and say something controversial. Too many people, myself included, have, have been told and said, well, we're all just God's children. How many people have heard that? Maybe you've said it. I've said it. But is that biblically accurate? Because the scripture says, we're all made in the image of God. But Jesus himself dealt with this. In John 8, Jesus is being badgered again. 
not by law, not by the, the outside, but by the religious leaders. The Pharisees come to him, and Jesus says, guys, you're truly my disciples if you remain faithful to my teachings, and you will know the truth, and the truth will what? Set you free. Oh, the Pharisees freaked out. They hated that. The descendants, they looked and said, we're descendants of Abraham. What do you mean? We've never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean you'll be set free? And Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. And every one of us have sinned. Therefore, we are under the slave, we are under the curse of sin. Did you catch that? Every one of us. Does that mean the Pope has sinned? Yeah. Does that mean the pastor has sinned? Yeah. Does that mean Michael Sweet from Striper has sinned? Yes. Well, no, yeah, even him. We've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. That's why we needed a savior. This is why we need a redeemer. So Jesus says, I tell you the truth. Everyone who sins is a slave of sin. And they rebuked him and said, oh, oh, our father is Abraham. <laughs> Jesus, I love it. He says, no. <laughs> no. If you were really the children of Abraham, you would follow his example. For you are children of your father, the devil. Did you catch that? You're children of your father, the devil. You love to do what is evil. Every one of us are born with a sinful nature. This is why Jesus came. We all must surrender to the Lordship of Christ to be adopted into God's family. Sin has separated us from the Father, and Jesus came to be the bridge, to be the one to rescue us, to bring us back. So lest anyone think, again, that I'm preaching there's many roads to God and we're just one big happy family, just group hug, whatever, all in. It's not what Scripture says. Let me make no mistake. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, period. His words, not mine. Okay, this is, this is what it, because of Jesus, God has allowed us to be adopted into one family. We are grafted in. He has graciously allowed us to have a seat at the table once again. If you could put us all together, we may not look like one big normal family. Put all the Christians in all one giant room and cross. But if you could look at our hearts, you would see every one of them that has surrendered to Jesus has been washed clean by the blood of the Lamb. That is what makes us one. We are all children of Abraham. Paul says that. It's kind of strange because it kind of seems like we were just talking about Jesus. He says, now that you belong to Christ, you're the true children of Abraham. You're his heirs. And God's promise to Abraham now belongs to you. What's that about? Remember, Paul is writing to people who take great pride, too much pride, in their bloodline. Take a lot of pride in their, their, their ability to trace their heritage back to Abraham. And if they could get somewhere back to Abraham, somehow they are guiltless in God's eyes. But that's not what the New Testament teaches I am not a child of Abraham because I have the right bloodline. I'm a child of Abraham because I have the same faith that Abraham had. Did you catch the difference? To make distinctions based on blood relation, that goes completely against the oneness of grace. In a few hours, I'll be preaching at Stone Ridge. It's, a place, it's the last place my mom lived before she went to be with Jesus. And they have a chapel service. Today I'm bringing, we're going to take the Lord's Supper. And I remember last time, I got on the elevator, and right before the doors opened, this lady looked at me, and she says, are you a, pre a preacher? And I said, well, I don't really like that word, but uh, I, yeah, I guess I'm a pastor. She said, I'm a Jew. And I said, is that right? That's a Jew by birth or a Jew by choice, right? And the doors opened. And I wish the service hadn't started. I wish I had more time to say, what, what is your standing with the Father? It was right, like, what, what did she mean by saying, I'm a Jew? You know, is she referred to a lineage? Is it God's chosen people? Nothing wrong with that. But is, she, is that going to be what makes her right with God when we stand before the Father? I wish I had taken that chance to, to probe deeper. What Paul is talking about destroys all these things that we do and who we are. It's all about Christ. You know, go back to the Cane Ridge Revival for a second. Can you put that picture back up? In the archives of ch church history, this is going to go down as one of the greatest revivals of all time, leading to one of the great awakenings in America. The Restoration Movement was launched here. This was a time when everybody put aside what they thought Scripture said, and they got back to what Scripture actually said, that Jesus is the true source and authority over his church. If we don't see a move of God in our generation. Our children will only know about it in history books. You kind of sensed it through our worship time with what Pastor Jason was preaching about. If we don't have that longing for a moving of God like this, 
Don't expect it to come. Don't expect revival. I'm just going to say, revival is not going to come because of how we vote on Tuesday. Should you vote? Absolutely. If you don't vote, don't complain. But, buddy, if we put our faith in a ballot box only, we need an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit. That doesn't begin with lost people, guys. That begins with us. That's on us. We are the bride of Christ. We are the ones who have access. The Holy Spirit has sealed our hearts. The oneness of grace, I wonder if we're on the precipices because we see this great falling away of so many churches, so many whole denominations. Yet at the same time, I can sense a great outpouring. And we read that that happens, that there is a flicker, a flame. Those embers are being stirred up. You can sense it. If you're spiritually attuned, you know that God wants to do something so powerful. It doesn't have to be relegated to history on the day of Pentecost. Let me ask you a strange question. I'll just, I'll, we'll end with this. Musicians, you guys can go ahead and come back up. Here's a strange question. I want you to think back to when you were a kid. Can you remember the name of your first grade teacher? You can, can't you? And if not your first grade, can you remember your second grade teacher? I picture her face right now. Mrs. Meindertzma. Oh, my goodness. I remember her. I thought she was so pretty to be so old, right? <laughs> then I got older. I realized she was 26. But Mrs. Meindertz, but oh, when I walked into the room, she made me feel like I was the only student in the school. I read about this incredible story called The Whisper Test. And Mary Ann Bird writes this. She says, I grew up knowing I was different, and I hated it. See, I was born with a cleft palate, a malformity, a deformity. And when I started school, my classmates made it clear that they noticed and just how different I looked to them. Here I was with a, a, a misshapen lip, a crooked nose, lopsided teeth, and because of that, my speech was all garbled and no one could understand me. When the schoolmates came up to me and would ask, what happened to your face? I would lie and tell them, I fell and I cut it on a sharp piece of glass. See, in my little mind, I thought it was more acceptable to have suffered an accident than to admit I was born different. I was convinced of this, no one outside my family would ever love me. That is, except my second grade teacher, Mrs. Leonard. Everyone loved her. She was a sparkling lady, short, round, and happy. And every year at school, we would have a hearing test. Y'all remember that? And Mrs. Leonard gave the test to every single person in the class. And finally, it was my turn. And I knew from previous years that we would go and we would stand up against the door and she would come, and she would have us cover one ear, and she would pick one, and she would whisper some simple comment. And we would have to repeat it back. Something like, I like your shoes. Is that a new dress? What did you eat for breakfast? And you'd have to repeat it back. So there I was. I stood there waiting to hear the words she would say. And they must have been words from God himself. That morning, seven words changed my life. Mrs. Leonard leaned forward and in her whisper she said, I wish you were my little girl. Boom. How do you think that made her feel? Loved? Part of the family? No, no, this is what our Father says to us. Every one of us who are deformed by sin, who have been scarred by sin, God says, I wish you were my daughter. I wish you were my son. And because of that, I'm going to provide a way for you to come back home. I'm going to send my son, who's innocent, who's blameless, Jesus, to come and take your sin. I'm going to throw it all on him because without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sin. That's why he's called the sacrificial lamb. Now you know. All of the wrath, all of the anger, all of the horrible things we've done, blotted out by the blood of the lamb. I wish you were my son. Now you can be. You can be brought back, adopted into a right relationship with him. So if you're here today and you've been far away from the Father and you would like to be restored to the family, today is your day. Very reverently, would you just pray with me? Bow right where you are. God, I thank you that your word tells us if we confess with our mouth that you are Lord, we believe in our heart that you have raised from the dead, that we can be saved. Lord, we acknowledge you as Savior, as Redeemer. Pray that you would come and cleanse my sin. I confess it to you.
I don't hide it. I don't negotiate it. I admit it. I need you to forgive me and restore me to the family. Holy Spirit, would you enter my heart? Would you seal me for the day of redemption? Take control from this day forward, Lord, as I surrender to your lordship, to your authority. Help me not live for myself. I want to live for you, to have a greater purpose, to have joy and peace and a passion to get out of bed every day. God, thank you that you didn't leave me as an orphan to to just wander aimlessly, but you provided that way to come back. I accept it and I receive it. In Jesus' name, amen. According to scripture, if you had a heartfelt conversion, you are a child of God. Maybe you just want to take a minute. We're going to stand and sing one last song. You want to just come and thank the Lord for salvation. Maybe you've got a family member who needs to make that confession of faith. Maybe it's time for you to follow up with believers' baptism. Whatever God's leading you to do, would you just be obedient today? He is here. His word is spoken. What is your response? Let's stand together. Unite our hearts as we sing, as we pray, as we worship. You come. The altar is open.